the little voice come on. There you go. So we are recording. Uh, we would love for you to keep your camera on if you can, but we also understand uh, if you cannot. And uh, given that we are recording and we will be live streaming, I think. Yeah, I'm trying uh, to make that work. We're working on the live streaming. So I always tell people, just as a quick reminder, if you are hiding from the authorities in some way, it's a good idea to change your name and to uh, turn the camera off. So um, I am Mario Sakura. Um, I am CEO of Awareness to Action International, and uh, we are going to be talking about taking the Enneagram to work. And I am joined with uh, Maria by Maria Jose Monita. Uh, Maria Jose, take a second out of your hard work there and say hello. Hello. All right, great. Good so, to see you. Hi from Chile. <laughs> all right. And uh, also with Tamar Zanati. So Tamar, say hi. Hello, everyone. I am Tamir Zanetti, and this is my real name. I'm not changing it for the authority or something, and I am from Cairo. <laughs> Tamir is in defiance of the authorities here today, yeah. <laughs> so uh, good, good for you. It was nice knowing you, Tamir. All right, so, um, uh, so again, we're going to be talking about taking the Enneagram to work, and our goal for this session is to just share with you some of the lessons that we have learned over the years of using the Enneagram in organizations and what the implications of that are. Most people who come to the Enneagram come to it through a kind of psycho-spiritual environment. And the language does not always translate uh, that well to a corporate environment. Now that said, uh, the things we teach are not just, you know, um, I guess old wine in new bottles necessarily, right? Uh, there are some nuances to the way that we teach things. And, um, you know, we won't get too much into those today, but if you follow our other webinars or come to our certification program, you will find out about that, okay? Petra, it's always good to see you. I'm always happy to see that you uh, survived another round of jumping out of airplanes. Are you still doing that? Uh, yeah, I do. We started in June, um, jumping out of airplanes almost every weekend. All right, great. Uh, Petra is a uh, competitive um, skydiver with a team, so uh, she's a much braver person than I am, that's for sure. So um, anyway, so uh, Tamara, why don't you share the slides with us, okay, and uh, we'll start setting up what our objective is here and what we're going to try and accomplish. So um, um, again, our goal here is to share with you things that we have learned and also uh, to answer questions that you might have. Okay, so please feel free to use the chat um, and, um, you know, let us know if you have questions. We are going to ask you a couple of specific questions here and we'll ask you to use the chat to respond to those as well. Okay, so uh, Maria, Jose, Tamar, anything uh, else we should say before we get started here? You know, I'm eager to get started. All right, great. So enough of the chit chat is what you're saying, huh? All right. I was going to kill a little time to let people come in late, you know, and uh, but uh, we will get started now. OK, so um, again, uh, we are we started a, a company called Awareness to Action International. Um, uh, I started using the Enneagram in organizations in 1997. Uh, which is a really long time ago from those of you, the you in the U.S. or who followed U.S. politics. Bill Clinton was president when I started using the Enneagram in organizations, right? So that's a long, long time ago. Um, and when was that, Mario? What year? 1997. Yeah, it was when I first started using the Enneagram in organizations. So uh, in fact, he, I think he was just starting his second term and the whole Monica Lewinsky thing. Uh, that might have happened before. But anyway, we won't go into that. Okay. So... Um, the point is here, we've been doing this a long time. And like I said, we've learned a few lessons along the way. And our goal is to share with you, um, you know, some of the lessons we learned, some of the mistakes that we made, I should say that I made because uh, I started doing this a long time before Maria Jose and Tamar. But, um, and, you know, hopefully you can learn from those things. All right. Um, now, let's see. So in this webinar, we're going to talk about common challenges to using the Enneagram in organizations and our suggestions for, excuse me, for addressing those challenges. And again, uh, any questions you might have. Now, we only have an hour. Uh, so if we don't get to all of your questions during this session, uh, a lot of times what we'll do is kind of record a YouTube video um, of addressing the questions. So we may do that 
Now, uh, Tamara, take us to the next slide here, please. Yeah, I, I, I would add that we tend to want to share too much and yeah. we don't have time. I mean, it's never enough time to share as much as we would like to. So feel free to ask questions and we will, as Mario was saying, address them later in different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. We always try to shove 12 pounds of stuff in a 10 pound bucket, as they say, and, uh, you know, sometimes makes a little bit of a mess. But uh, real quick point here. So uh, we are starting our next certification program on September 15th. And for the, um, you know, for making the effort to register for this webinar, we are offering a discount code for 10% off the price. Uh, which is good for 48 hours. So if you're interested in our certification program and want to take advantage of this, um, you've got 48 hours to do so. It's 10% off. And uh, just so you know that there are options for, uh, you know, multiple payments for the certification program. So, um, yeah. So, so on the certification program, this is a program to um, equip people to uh, use the Enneagram uh, in a professional way with clients, coaches, um, in therapy, etc. Uh, it has three levels. Level one, it's the Enneagram, the instinctual biases, the um, nine strategies, and the 27 subtypes, and the awareness to action process. That it's what we do with all of that, self-awareness and awareness of others. Uh, so although it's kind of level one, it's kind of the Enneagram as a whole. And then the other model, model modules are uh, more on applications of the Enneagram. Great, all right. And of course, if you have any questions on the program, uh, reach out to us at info at awareness to action .com. Okay, so um, we have a quick question for you just to get a sense of uh, who is in the room. Um, you know, um, and a sense of what your questions are. Um, if you would write in the chat, in your current work with the Enneagram and organizations or in preparing for it, what are the main obstacles you encounter or perceive that you will? Okay. I remember when I first started using the Enneagram in organizations and I would draw that diagram up on a whiteboard, you know, in front of a, in a group of, um, you know, senior corporate executives, I would get a whole bunch of kind of weird looks or questions or, you know, what the heck is that? You know, we're going to, you know, light candles and do, you know, dance around in purple robes or something like that. Uh, I think that people are more open-minded to it than they used to be, but, you know, the Enneagram does have kind of a, uh, an unusual background and a weird name and uh, uh, kind of strange looking diagram. So uh, that's one of the obstacles that, you know, people are sometimes concerned of, but if you have any others, please list them uh, in the, uh, in the chat. All right. Um, Tamar, I want you to take us to the next slide, please. Are we going to wait a bit to read? Um... Yeah, I guess uh, let's... Yeah. Uh... Yeah, okay, we're to supposed to actually, we're supposed now that you stop talking, we can that. focus on the answers for a we're, couple of minutes. We're supposed to actually care what other people say. Huh? Yes. That's, that's great. Thank you, guys. See, this is why I have partners. So thank you for reminding me here. All right. Great. So, Vanessa. Hello, Vanessa. I didn't know that you're with us today. Vanessa is saying uh, that uh, the time organization want to spend on Enneagram versus the time that is needed to really do work with the Enneagram. Mm. So yeah. this is a challenge. Yeah, so this is a great question or a great point, Vanessa. And uh, without getting into too much detail about this, this is one of the, um, you know, when we present the Enneagram in organizations, you know, I've had clients say to me, okay, give us something in 90 minutes, right? Um, you don't get five days or something like that that you would for a certification program. So you really have to be conscious about what your goals are and what the audience needs and what can you give them that is of value, right? Even if it's not everything that you would like to give them, okay? So what is something you can give them that is a takeaway that will make their life better in some way, even if they're not becoming sort of masters of the Enneagram, right? Um, you know, one of the realities is that most of the clients you work with in organizations are, you know, have very specific goals uh, when they're doing an Enneagram program. 
And it's usually just to give people some insight into the people that they work with. So what we have done is kind of designed a way of, you know, presenting this, um, focusing on just this idea of these nine strategies, right? Um, and, uh, you know, helping people understand those strategies, okay? But again, I think that's something that we can probably talk about more in a, in a, in a video rather than me spending the whole hour on that, like I certainly could. Okay. Actually, a lot, lots of uh, answers to the questions that are really amazing that, I mean, if we read them, we'll take an hour, but um, I mean, we will read them and probably our discussion, the next slides will answer, I mean, will address these challenges. Yeah. 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 Great questions. I'm just kind of skimming through them here. Um, accessible. Yeah. Experienced folks in a box. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Preventing them from boxing each other. Absolutely right, uh, Ingrid. And that's something I think we're going to touch on when we talk about language because it's so important. Okay. Now, here's one of the first things I learned. So, again, like I said, I'm, I'm, well, I didn't say this, but it goes without saying, I'm a pretty old person and I've been around doing this a long time. Um, and one of the, you know, when I started doing executive coaching, it didn't really exist as a field in the way that it does now, right? There was no International Coach Federation. You know, you could find a couple of books on executive coaching, but not that much. Um, one of the things that was happening in the U.S. is that the way that the healthcare systems reimbursed psychologists was changing, right? And so they were going to more managed care programs, meaning that Insurance companies would only pay therapists for like five sessions with a client, you know, maybe 10 sessions. And so therapists started to say, hey, wait a minute, I got to find out a way to make some money here because I'm not able to make it from clients the way I used to. So a lot of therapists uh, started going in and becoming executive coaches, right? They'd say, "Ah, oh, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll just be a corporate therapist in a way. And one of the things I saw a lot of people struggle with is that they really didn't understand the needs of the corporate environment, okay, or the demands of the corporate environment. And this is one of the most important things we always tell people when you want to use the Enneagram in an organization. Remember that it is a different environment, okay? Not better, not worse, it's just different. And one of the things here is that people want to see results quickly. Okay. Tamara, you were telling me an interesting story today, and you don't have to name any names, but, um, you know, the way that some Enneagram trainings are done around this idea of results. Uh, yeah. Share that with us? Yeah. Actually, I've seen lots of uh, uh, teachers who are mainly, I mean, and I, I understand that they are using the Enneagram with the public uh, attendees of their programs to create a kind of a journey. It's like, uh, you know, awareness, uh, long journey of awareness. And when they try to take that to corporate, I mean, they, I mean, the attendees or the, get disconnected completely. Uh, and this is what makes lots of corporate from maybe uh, experience not being encouraged to uh, have Enneagram programs inside. So it's like more the focus on the Enneagram rather than the challenges of the business. Yeah, and so, 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 I've seen yeah. actually, actually, Maria and Maria, yeah, I've seen these teachers complaining that uh, people in corporate are not aware enough to accept their teaching, which, which I don't think the case because these are very successful people. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. When so it's, I don't even try to sell the enneagram to clients. It's you sell a solution to the problems they have. So they need better results. And the Enneagram is a really good tool to become more aware and uh, solve some issues or resistances they might may have, but it needs to be focused on results in um, solving a problem and like understanding uh, who is there, what, what is it that they need and see if the Enneagram is the best tool for that. It might not be. Yeah, yeah. It may not be, but it usually is, so. <laughs> yeah, to me, to me, the metaphor here is like when I go to a surgeon to, 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 do a, to make an operation on me and the surgeon start talking about whatever instrument 
is going to use in the operation. It's really irrelevant. I mean, my need is really to overcome whatever illness I have or something like overcoming my challenge is not really the tool set of the surgeons. And I think some teachers get uh, really uh, maybe out of love of the Enneagram because it's really a powerful tool, get focusing on the Enneagram, not the client. Yeah, great. All right, um, take us to the next slide, Tamara. So this kind of builds off of that last point, right? Um, you know, I, I often hear Enneagram teachers, you know, saying, well, you know, you just have to be present and then you'll figure it all out and you just have to be aware and you just have to be mindful. And if you can get rid of your ego, then all of your natural innate wisdom will spring forth. Okay. Uh, that's not really how it works. Okay. Uh, Self-awareness is important, but it's important because it leads, it helps us get to effective action, right? So when we use the Enneagram, what we're doing is not, you know, we're helping them build self-awareness, but it's practical self-awareness and it's directed self-awareness. Okay. So again, the point here is, you know, we're helping people become more aware so they can make better choices about how they live their lives, do their work, interact with other people. Okay. Uh, even when you read about, you know, the, the history of Buddhism, you realize that mindfulness, as the Buddha taught it, was not the end goal, right? It was the starting point, okay? It was the starting point so the students could pay attention long enough to hear the teachings and do the work of change and growth, okay? So I always tell people that it starts with awareness, but it needs to lead to action, okay? And if you don't do the work around awareness, you're just going to keep committing the same actions over and over again. Okay. And, and we need to be careful that it doesn't need to be kind of like an overload of self-awareness. Uh, some of the issues uh, in the chat had to do with uh, having enough time to kind of cover everything or be willing to uh, look at yourself. And yes, but this is not, when you're working with organizations, it's usually not something that you decide to do or pay to do yourself. It's something that it's good for the business many times. And it's a really good opportunity for self-awareness and improving your relationships in general. In fact, most people kind of feel really engaged when they see their spouses or their kids. However, there's no need for them to become fully aware about everything they do. I think that it's important that they start becoming aware in the things related to where the issues are, at least. And a few other things, whatever they're prepared to. But I don't think we need to feel the need uh, to have them see everything about themselves. Yeah. I, I, uh, Ingrid just made a, you know, a good point here. And, you know, and I can share with you that when I first started using the Enneagram you know, in, in my work in the corporate world, I explained way too much, right? I mean, I told people way too much. I, you know, went into, gave them much too much information. Um, and, you know, it was just counterproductive. And the, the longer I've been doing this work, the less I find the need to share. Now, you can always provide resources to them. And for those who want to go deeper, you can always give that. But again, don't feel like you have to teach people everything that you know, okay? Um, a good metaphor is uh, really relevant this uh, time uh, the, for, because of the Olympic Games. So I, I would say like people in business are after performance and achievements similar to uh, athletes in the Olympic Games. So if I go and tell any of the athletes that focusing is enough, uh, knowing yourself is enough, I think it's, it's really not possible to get any results if you just focus and be self -aware. You need to develop the skills. You need to keep on training. You need to keep on doing the work. So it's very similar to what we, work, what we do in organizations. Yes, you need to be self-aware. Yes, you need to focus. Yes, you need to be mindful and have skills to use to achieve your objectives. Yeah, yeah and, and, and the other thing is that when you present it that way, uh, another of the issues that was brought up uh, in the chat was that, yeah, not everyone is ready uh, or ready to see your um, weaknesses. And yes, 
But when you see, when you are able to show people that they will be more effective if they change this or that, uh, they will be more interested, more better prepared to look at certain things about themselves because there's a purpose, there's a benefit for doing it. I'll also say that um, on that point, um, and look, nobody likes to hear negative things about themselves. Yeah. I know that I certainly don't, but um, uh, so don't give me any negative feedback in the comments, please. I really appreciate that. Um, but the um, uh, what I find is that people in organizations, especially if they're fairly senior people in organizations, they want feedback right? They want to know what their weaknesses are so they can improve, right? So this gets to a point we're going to talk about later, but when you, people will accept feedback if you position it correctly, if you express it correctly, if you do it from a place of compassion and growth and understanding that, you know, you're not screwed up, you're just an eight right? Um, and you're making all the same mistakes that most eights make, and that's okay, or a seven or a five or whatever it is. So you're just doing the things that are natural for somebody from your personality style and this mindset that you bring to things, and you can grow and improve. Most people eat up that kind of feedback, right? Take my word for it. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, Go ahead. And, 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 and then in business, people, they are after uh, achieving their own objectives and organizational objectives. So when you tie this to achieving objectives and present these, uh, let's say, weakness as areas of development, so basically you're giving them uh, an opportunity to achieve business objective, the opportunity to grow, the opportunity to uh, become, I mean, to be promoted, uh, to get the business achieving their objectives. Let's move to the next slide, please. And don't try to change everything about the person. I mean, some people say, okay, I'm a two, what do I have to do? No problem, don't do anything. Yeah. Uh, it has to be linked to where the issues are. So on this slide, we talk about defining the Enneagram. You have to come up with a good definition of what the Enneagram is for when people ask you a definition that is two sentences at most, okay, that is clear and that um, people can understand, okay? So when people ask us what the Enneagram is, we say something to the effect of the Enneagram is a model of two elements of personality style. The first element is what we call three instinctual biases, which are a system of values and focuses of attention. And the second component is nine strategies for satisfying those values. Okay. These two elements work together to shape 27 different personality profiles. Okay. And we use this model to help people see themselves, make changes and become more effective. Okay. So again, you have to be able to put it in terms that, um, uh, people understand and get. Okay. So, uh, Suze, your question here is, can you please type that description for us? Um, we'd have to listen to the recording. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'll do, Sue, is that when, you know, I'm going to send a follow-up uh, email to everybody after the session, I will include it in there. Okay. Because I probably would repeat it back a different way if I said it again. Okay. But the important thing is that, um, you know, we also, we always start all of our trainings with this quote in the lower corner here. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Alan commented earlier that the Enneagram is a map, not the territory, right? You're absolutely right. It is a model. It's a representation of the world or some component of the world. And as such, it is limited. One of the challenges that I think people bring to the Enneagram is that they try to use it to explain too much, right? They try to explain everything about everybody through the lens of the Enneagram. So they keep adding all these pieces and all these elements and all these different, you know, components to it. Well, a map the size of a city is not very useful, 
okay? Um, we have to condense things. So we try to boil things down to the most fundamental elements, okay? What is kind of the minimum viable version of the Enneagram for the organization or the group that we're working with? Now, I don't mean to make it simplistic. Okay? I don't mean to take out the substance, but you have to be able to present it in a way that's clear and concise. Okay, And recommend that sometimes people do the things they do simply because their mother dropped them on their head when they were a baby and it has nothing to do with what Enneagram type they are. Okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, and we're going to address the language later, but we do this in layers so we know that if we have just a little time we describe the basic things with a really short description and in a way like for example with instinct the the strategies or the types the inner types we talk about striving to feel perfect or striving to feel connected we have one feeling need for each of them and can explain the basic logic of each type and with that, sometimes if we have an hour, uh, people can do something with it. They won't change, uh, but getting that bit of additional awareness will be better than not doing anything. Now, if I present the Enneagram in a way that it's a lot of traits that I have to go through, describe in order to, for people to get a basic sense of the type, that will not work. So the way in which this, you describe it, you, you have the definitions of the types of the uh, instinctual biases of the Enneagram in general, and then how you present it in layers, uh, not one type for three hours, but one round and then another round with deeper things. And then another one allows you to uh, use the time you have and still leave people with something that will be valuable. That was one of the other, another thing that was in the chat. It's like, not sure that um, you have the time. Um, I think there was something like that, that you have enough time uh, to do it. We are the opposite. Depending on the time we have, it's what we decide to present. Yeah, I mean, uh, Maria Ozzy, I remember, I guess it's uh, uh, Mark Twain who said, give me time to uh, to write a short letter, I think. Yeah, he um, said, I apologize for writing such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. Exactly. So, so, so what I'm trying to say, it took us lots of time to be able to come up with these layers that are short and getting into depths layer by layer over uh, over time that is needed by the organization. So it took us lots of time to do that. Yeah. Now we have it. Yeah. So, and, and just something to keep in mind, if a company ever comes to you and says, hey, you know, we have two hours, can you do an Enneagram session for us? Jump on it, right? Don't say, oh, I couldn't possibly do justice to the Enneagram in two hours. Two hours of the Enneagram is better than zero hours of the Enneagram. And if you impress them, they'll bring you back for more, right? So, yeah. you know, just take advantage of whatever you can get. It's usually a way in. Yeah. And um, what we sometimes do is just to talk about the instinctual biases if it's a really short time yeah. so that they can go, get away with something of value uh, and not trying to cover too much, but then not enough of anything. And, and remember, again, your objective is not to make this person attending uh, your session an expert of the Enneagram. It's, you know, exactly like going to the doctor and expecting to become a, another doctor. No, this is not the case. I mean, you're giving these uh, attendees or, I mean, the, the corporate attendees exactly the level of knowledge that they need to address their challenges. So always remind yourself that this is your job, not teaching them the Enneagram. Yeah. It's a great analogy, Tamara. I like that one. I hadn't heard it before. <laughs> going to the doctor with the expectation of becoming a doctor. All right, um, let's go to the next slide, please. The history, okay? Um, so the history of the Enneagram is shrouded in mythology and mystery and big, you know, tall tales and, you know, uh, and uh, assumptions and all these other sort of things, right? So hardly ever does anybody ask me in the corporate world, where did this thing come from? Okay, almost nobody outside the Enneagram world gives a damn about where this thing came from. OK, 
Okay. All they want to know is, does this work? Will it help me? Okay. So leave the history out of it. Okay. Unless you're specifically asked. And whenever I am asked, Number one, I do not say that it's an ancient Sufi system. Number one, because it's not, okay? Claudio Naranjo made up that story, okay? And there's a video of him admitting that on YouTube. You can Google origin of the Enneagram Claudio Naranjo, and he says, I just made that up because I thought it would sell the idea better, all right? Um, you know, who amongst us is without flaw, right? So, um, the Enneagram, when people ask... Well, well Marion, not only that, there is no uh, evidence whatsoever beyond this statement that it's yes. coming from a Sufi origin. Yes, and this is coming from a Sufi, okay? So Tamar knows, right? And so we also have other friends who are Sufi scholars and will tell you it just ain't there. Now, there's a lot of talk about it being rooted in Egypt and about this and that. Some of the ideas that have shaped the Enneagram or influenced the Enneagram are very old, but the Enneagram of personality as we know it really traces back to, we could say Ichazo, right? Oscar Ichazo, but Claudio Naranjo is really the guy that put the current shape on it and other people have worked with it since then, okay? So whenever people ask me about it, I just refer to Claudio Naranjo as being the guy who really shaped this model. And it has been used as an open source system by many people since then, meaning that lots of people have different interpretations of it and that is fine, okay? As long as those interpretations are, you know, measure what they say they do and do not contradict themselves, okay? And, and, so, so, and sometimes these uh, narratives that made the, the corporate stay away from the Enneagram. Absolutely. They are not correct narratives. And at the same time, corporate are looking for practical and pragmatic tools to use. So it's, it's really almost impossible to present these stories to corporate for them to use it. Yeah. Look, if an engineer is learning about engineering, he doesn't care that it came from you know aristotle right or a biologist he wants to know what is is this useful what is the latest state of the art technology on it and how can i make it work all right so skip over the history as best you can all right next uh, slide please yeah we have another question for you yeah. okay oh so, yeah we do right yeah yeah we did talk about language so i mean working with corporates working in organizations what kind of challenges do you see regarding common enneagram languages so and, and Tamara, how about if uh while they're answering that um we go on and talk about the next slide just in the interest of time um, yeah, but, also... but if, they, if they don't have a minute without you talking it's the, <laughs> I mean, let them think well, actually just next slide seconds. is the answer Mari. yes <laughs> okay then go back go back all right so sorry sorry <laughs> see the problem is if i go a minute without me talking i get really you know so, uh, <laughs> so probably this is one of the challenges <laughs> <laughs> i just got a note that my camera is blurry so hang in there a second i'm going to see what i can do to fix this yeah i guess vanessa's saying i mean good answer childhood won't core fear so this is kind of language that is challenging in corporates yeah Kimberly saying passions and fixations uh caroline Inglis, uh, first different authors use different languages for instinctual biases also with wings arrows which we hardly touch on but people always ask menda is saying the word enneagram is weird and so is the diagram <laughs> back to basics just yeah. everything about it <laughs> uh fixation uh, yeah, anyone would like to talk no i think it's somebody yeah yeah the, the the term type is also like boxing up like uh, uh Bilbo models in your lexicon tends toward religion and diagnosis codes. Sexual, Kimberly is saying sexual, the, the term sexual in the instincts or 
uh, obviously the SX model rather than one to one gets people stuck. So I mean, we we address lots of uh, lots of challenges. So Mario, now you can talk. <laughs> now I can talk. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. All right. So yeah, all of those are real weird, you know, real challenges, right? The word itself. Okay, I remember talking to somebody, you know, years and years ago, and the first thing he says, "You got to change that name," you know, and you know, I said, "I wish I could." Right? And we've thought about it, and we've yeah. thought about hiding the mod. I mean, not showing the symbol. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but, you know, you got to and our, our ultimate decision was, you know what, you just got to own it. Right. You just got to say, you know what? Yeah. OK, this is a little strange, but hang in there with me and I'll explain it. OK, so a uh, couple of points here. Um, all the points you made, childhood origins, number one. OK, um, stay away from it. OK, first of all, OK, and this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine. It's it's purely hypothetical. OK, there is no evidence that our childhood origins shape our personality style. OK, there's no evidence at all that you're a nine because your father did this or your mother did that. OK, it's it's a hypothesis. Uh, people can, you know, re relate to say, yeah, that resonates with my experience, but there's no evidence of it. OK, so stay away from childhood origins, stay away, in my view, from, you know, ideas of early wounds and, you know, all these things, because it's speculative. All right. And when you're working in an organization, you are not doing therapy anyway. OK, so I always tell my clients, I don't care what your relationship with your mother was. OK, if you want to talk about that. Go to a psychologist outside of work, but that's not my job. Okay. And if, you know, I come across a client who I think needs professional, you know, um, a mental health professional, you know, I would perhaps recommend that they seek one. Okay. Or say, you know what, we've reached the limit of my expertise. So you might want to talk to somebody else about these issues rather than me. Okay. All so right. you have to, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sorry, I, I think that the um, outside of the Enneagram world, people who really understand how you do research and how these things work would question, like, how do you know? Would ask, yeah. how do you know that this is because your parents did this or didn't do that? And there's no way to answer that because it's, as you were saying, speculative. Yeah. So we need to be very careful because what... Enneagram people, kind of Enneagram circles, accept kind of almost like with faith. It is not the same outside of the Enneagram yeah. circles. And um, so even if, it's, it is, if it is therapy or if you want to do deep work, we need to be careful with how we present it and what ideas we apply because it's many of them just don't, I mean, they're not, there's no way to prove them. Yeah. yeah. Well, one important point and the answers as well is you using the word type that is boxing somehow and so on. Mario, how, how do you tackle that? Yeah, so this is tricky, right? Because so, and this gets to the kind of this slide that we have up here. So we prefer to use verbs when we're talking about these um, components of the Enneagram model. When we talk about the instinctual bias, we talk about preserving, navigating, and transmitting. Again, all verbs, things that people do, right? Areas of life that they pay attention to and attend to, okay? Preserving, navigating, transmitting. When it comes to the Enneagram types, the nine types, we refer to them as strategies, Okay, strategies rooted in a particular striving for an emotional state. So the one is striving to feel perfect. The nine is striving to feel peaceful. The eight is striving to feel powerful, etc. Okay, what this does is get out of the box. It's not an ontological assessment of the individual. You are this. It is saying you have a habitual tendency to do these things. 
And that can be liberating for people because it feels like they have now some sense of control because I can't change who I am, but I can modify what I do. All right. Yeah. So this is really important. Go ahead, Maria. Yeah, that, that what I think we're doing more and more is presenting this as these are the nine different logics that people tend to have. And this is how they see the world, they approach it, how they react to it with this logic. Now, using the same logic, you can react to the uh, things that come your way in different ways. With the same logic, different behaviors uh, can come up. I mean, you can, um, you can do different behaviors, but it's the logic that you're what you're understanding about yourself and about other people it's not who they are yeah ego strategy i mean lucy well, stay away from the word ego right yeah. i mean it's 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 a psychological word it's not a corporate word when you use the word ego in the business world you think of people having big egos right and so i would just stay away from it yeah okay. it's usually have a, a negative connotation yeah. and it's yeah. like something that you have to get rid of yeah. And yeah. yeah. So uh, a couple more points about the languages. Yeah, absolutely. The vices and virtues, you know, you don't want to go in and say to somebody, you know, work with a team and say, well, the problem is you're a lust type and you're a gluttony type and oh, you're the slothful type and, you know, all these sort of things. That stuff is great to know. And if you're using the Enneagram, you certainly should be aware of the traditional ways of talking about the Enneagram, right? You should understand what the Enneagram literature means by sloth in a nine. It doesn't mean that they're lazy. It means that they're lazy in a psycho-spiritual sense. But not, I know nines who are some of the hardest working people I've ever met, okay? So we have to understand that stuff, but you just can't use it in an organization, okay? At least not more than once. Now, the other thing uh, was mentioned about the, uh, the, the, the word sexual in the, um, um, you know, regarding the subtypes. Absolutely, you cannot use that. Uh, but I also would suggest that the phrase or term one on one to one is very misleading. Okay. Uh, we use the term transmitting, and we did another webinar a while back. You can watch it on YouTube, our YouTube channel, uh, where we talk about the instinctual biases and our approach to them. Um, but we use, again, preserving, navigating for the so called social instinct and transmitting for that third domain, the sexual or one-to-one -one domain. Okay. We also we also have a podcast for each of these domains in case you oh, want to yeah. understand more what we're talking about, how it's not just sexual, but transmitting uh, has a broader scope. And we have one movie for each instinctual domain that you may, might be interested in. Yeah, it's the really Enneagram in a Movie dot com is uh, where you can find the podcast or on Spotify, that sort of thing. It's a good resource. All right. Uh, okay. Car Caroline is having a good point here. I mean, she's saying yeah. that she's using the, this language for uh, the instinctual biases, but she's concerned about uh, that the recipient will be confused with other languages used uh, by other approaches. Yeah. yeah I but tell people that if they go into the internet, they will find other descriptions. Uh, that I've seen and studied several, and these are the ones that I um, think better represent what we're talking about, uh, and that they will find other things, that this is like an open source, and there are different labels for each of the domains and the types. And not, yeah. not only the instincts or the instinctual biases, even the yeah. types, you will find each approach is giving different names for each type. So this is the nature of an open source. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, at, at some point, everybody will see the light and uh, adopt, um, you know, my terminology. But until that point, you know, we're just going to have to, you know, be open with people and say there are different ways of talking about things. And here's the way, you know, these people talk about it. And here's the way these people talk about it. Most of the people I work with are smart enough to you know, figure it out and make a decision on what works for them. So. And I would say each uh, each language is really um, uh, is really trying to achieve a certain objective. So our objective is to work with organization or the, on their challenges and achieve their objectives. Other languages are uh, psycho spiritual in nature. So 
it's it, the language is used for different objects. Yeah, I'm going to object a little bit to what you said there, Tamar, because my okay. view is that the current language is 100 years out of date. It's based on uh, outdated 100 year old neo Freudian ideas about the way uh, biology works. Uh, I'm working on a white paper to describe all that right now, and I'll publish it in a couple of weeks. But, um, you know, but that's besides the point. So I think there are reasons beyond just using it in organizations for the terms that we use. Okay. Um, but uh, enough of that. Okay, let's move on, right? So here's an important point. Um, the um, uh, We should not use the Enneagram as our way of diagnosing what the client needs. We should find out what the client needs and then use the Enneagram to help them achieve it. For example, we don't want to go in, assess our client, decide that they're a type nine and say, you know what? you really need to become more assertive when it comes to interpersonal conflict uh, because you're a nine and nines tend to avoid conflict. Well, if you've ever lived with a nine, I grew up with one, my mother was a nine. If you've ever worked with a nine or coached a nine, you will realize that some nines are pretty aggressive people in certain environments, right? And the issue they have is not avoiding conflict, but getting into conflict because they're trying to reestablish a sense of inner peace, okay? So we have to find out, does this person have an issue with conflict or not, okay? If so, how can we use an understanding of them as a nine to help them deal with that, okay? If not, let's move on to something else that they really do have an issue with, okay? So please don't use the Enneagram as a way of um, you know, creating a developmental plan for somebody, especially in the corporate world, you have to get feedback on them either through a 360 assessment or, you know, identifying what they, you know, or having them identify what they want to work on. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. You have to have a method of development. You have to have some kind of growth framework to give people. Okay, you can't just say, okay, here's your Enneagram type, get better. You have to give them a process to be able to use. Okay, again, we did another podcast, I'm sorry, not a podcast, a uh, webinar where we talked about this. The inner triangle of the Enneagram for us serves as the, um, um, the what we call the awareness to action process, which takes people through a very specific developmental process. Once they, you know, we understand their Enneagram type, once we've identified what it is they want to work on, okay? But you have to, have to, have to have some process identified as a tool for growth, okay? Whatever that uh, is. And that's why we teach these uh, to people who are already working with clients or groups and in order so, so that they use the Enneagram as a tool uh, but the Enneagram in itself, it's not enough to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, one point, I see the comment here about the, uh, um, the uh, bees work on the uh, subtypes. Uh, I've, I've known B for years. I got a lot of respect for her and her work. We take a bit of a different approach to the uh, subtypes. Uh, so I, I'm currently publishing on my social media every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday descriptions of the different uh, subtypes. So you can follow along on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. Also, Maria Jose and I uh, co-authored a book called Instinctual Leadership. Uh, what was that last year, the year before Maria Jose that uh, includes uh, descriptions of all 27. There you go, Petra. All right. I knew I liked you for some reason. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. All right. Um, okay, next, uh, next slide, please. All right. That's work an important with, point. This is an important point here. Work with rather than against. Okay. You, what we mean by this is that you have to work with the strategy, not against it. You can't tell people, you know what, you have to reject your Enneagram type, you have to kill your ego, you have to, you know, cut off an arm and be somebody different than who you are. It simply will not work. Now, this doesn't mean that we tell people, hey, don't worry about it, you're fine, just as you are, keep doing what you're doing. No, 
we work with people to expand their definition of their preferred strategy so that they can incorporate more adaptive behaviors, okay? So if somebody is a two, we don't tell them, you know what, you have to stop connecting to people, right? You have to just, you know, stand up and be independent and don't worry what other people think because they're gonna tell you to get lost. What you have to help them do is understand how they can actually improve their connections to other people in a healthy, adaptive way if they learn to set good boundaries, okay? If you tell an eight, you know what, you need to just embrace your vulnerability and stop trying to be so strong and all these other sort of things, they're gonna kick your butt right out the door, okay? What you wanna tell them is, you know what, let's think about what it really means to be powerful and what role does kindness play in being powerful? What role does grace and mercy and magnanimity play in being powerful? What does being powerful really mean? Okay, you have to speak the language that people speak. Okay, if Tamar speaks to me in Arabic, I don't get a word of it. Okay, he might be telling me the most brilliant things, you know, known to man, but it is lost on me because he's not speaking my language, okay? So we have to work with what we have rather than against what somebody is. Okay? Yeah, and, and with what we have, it's what I said before about this logic. When I understand the logic of the person, you can work with it and find other ways to satisfy that feeling need uh, that are more adaptive, as Mario was saying. If I don't understand the logic, I won't be able to speak their language. That's kind of their language. Great. All right, good. Next slide. Oh, <laughs> right here. Um, <laughs> so the Enneagram is- Share a, your chimpanzee rule, Mario. <laughs> I don't think that's germane to this conversation, Maria Jose, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, but I'll share it anyway. So I always tell my clients when it comes to being compassionate towards other people, which I think is a slide we have coming up uh, soon, we have to keep in mind that biologically speaking, we share 98.6% of our DNA with chimpanzees, okay? So any day we're not swinging in trees and flinging poop at each other is a pretty good day. All right. So we have to understand human nature if we want to work with ourselves and work more effectively with other people. OK, we have to understand that no one is born tabula rasa, a blank slate upon which life and our psyche is etched. OK, we come in with a whole bunch of evolutionary adaptations that helped our ancestors survive but may well undermine our ability to effectively interact with other people, okay? Um, so there's a whole host of those things, you know, cognitive dissonance and the uh, confirmation, I'm sorry, the cognitive biases that spring from our attempts to understand that or to mitigate that are really important to understand, okay? When we're working with the Enneagram, we always try to ground it in some of the basics of cognitive psychology, okay, to understand our biases and the traps of the mind that undermine us, okay? Yeah. Go ahead. And, and the second part of the statement here, respecting the science, um, I mean, we, um, when, we, when we work with business, these are people who have, who has done the work, who has really researched and understand science very well. So coming up with, uh, uh, theories that are in conflict with science, mm, that's not a good idea to present uh, the Enneagram to businesses. So you need to, to really do the work. And uh, and this is what we did at Awareness Action to filter what has, uh, I mean, from the traditions or from the uh, whatever available in the Enneagram, what is in conflict with science. I want to be a perfect point, Tamara, and I want to uh, just emphasize something here. The Enneagram is not a scientific model, okay? But it doesn't have to be a scientific model to be useful, okay? Shakespeare was not a scientist, 
but he can teach us an awful lot about human nature. Okay, philosophy is not a science. This doesn't mean that we should dismiss whatever Plato had to say just because he wasn't a scientist. All right, we do not say, oh, you know, we have to prove the Enneagram with science. You can't do it any more than you can prove Plato or Shakespeare or, you know, the philosophy scientifically. What you can do is what Tamer said, make sure that you don't make assertions that contradict what we know through science. Okay? This is important. All right. And science, science is developing, so there are some theories that were valid in the beginning of the last century that has been proven not to be really correct uh, nowadays. So it, it's, really, it's really important to do the work and understand uh, the latest development of science. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, we, we should have probably put this one first because it applies to everything or... It's um, and, and it addresses uh, Minda's comment about and, and some of the people's about being or resisting probably working with teams because if they know other the other team members kind of type or personality style they might misuse it and I think that we need to teach it with compassion and fairness. And that involves how we talk about each of the types, how we talk about all the instinctual biases, how we genuinely see the higher side of each of them and speak to that. And also how we talk about tendencies, how they, it's, uh, you might see them doing this or they might tend to do that and not in a way that says five do this and one do that, or they never, or they always. I think we need to be very careful uh, in the way that we do it. And we usually say, if you don't feel more compassion towards yourself or other people, then there's no point in using the Enneagram. Yeah. Yeah, we have to look at our own biases in the way that we present this, okay? We all have biases, we all bring baggage with us, you know, and if we're in a, you know, if I'm, you know, if I had an argument with my wife last night, there's a good chance I'm going to be a little tougher on sevens today than I would be normally, right? Or on preservers or whatever it is, right? So we have to be really careful about this. And the beauty of the Enneagram I have found is if the person teaching it models the right way to do it, then those using it will use it in the right way, right? If you present it to others as a tool of understanding and compassion, they will use it that way. If you use it as a way of putting people in boxes and explaining why they're such screw ups or whatever it is, that's how the people who attend your trainings will use it as well. Okay, so it's really important for us to, to model that. Now, yeah, we... and it doesn't mean that we're going to say only good things about each type, yeah, but we can talk about it like with our own examples, taking ourselves lightly, uh, and that also helps. Yeah, just one quick point on that that we didn't touch on earlier. When we talk about people's use of the strategies, we use the terms adaptive or maladaptive, right? Are you using this strategy in a way that helps you reduce your suffering and the suffering of the people around you? Are you using it in a way that increases that? Okay. And what our goal is, is to improve the former and reduce the latter. All right. Very simple. Okay. All right. So just a reminder, okay, before we uh, let you go, because we are out of time here, uh, we have the, the next uh, uh, certification program coming up to the 15th, the code again, ATA84. Uh, check out the Enneagram in a Movie podcast, um, you know, which we had a lot of fun doing. We're gearing up for season two. Go ahead, Maria Jose. Yeah, that you have questions about the program, uh, about the content, the uh, structure, the modality that it's. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us, send us an email at info at awareness to action dot com. And uh, and we can schedule some time to talk and we can address these um, questions you may have. Yeah, and again, please feel free to send questions that we didn't get to uh, today. 
there is a something here is what is your takeaway from today and how would you translate this into action? If you have something you want to put in the chat about that, please do. But again, if you send us questions, uh, you know, what we often do is, you know, when we get some good questions uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk to as we record a video that we can place on YouTube and uh, answer it there. Okay. So, so thanks everybody. It was great to see some of my old friends here, Minda and Lance from Portland. I was so happy to see you guys. Uh, you know, and some others that, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to call out. And I can't see everybody on my screen, but, um, you know, really, really happy to see you all. So um, have a great rest of your day, folks. Tamara, Maria, Jose, as always, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.